It's Matt Santa Capital from the Santa Sales Houses team, and today we're with Renee from Edward Jones. We're going to talk about investing, TFSAs, RSPs, all that kind of fun stuff. So, yeah. Renee, let's. What got you into this space in the first place? Yeah, actually, um, when I was, it goes back to when I first just was deciding on what university I wanted to go to and what I wanted to study. And I remember growing up on my parents' farm, always, always calculating how much money I was going to make <laughs> um, per hour of, of work. And uh, so I got into the finance space after year or after high school. Um, and went into accounting in at Western here. And uh, yeah, so that's how that started. And the romance started there. And the romance started there, exactly, yeah. S- cool. So I know we've got um, one observation that I've made with younger people. Yeah. So like, let's just say like millennials, just to throw a name on it because that's fun. Um, where can they get started when it comes to investing? What should they be thinking? What can they do? I think millennials, a great place to start is a tax-free savings account. Um, I think getting in the mindset of putting certain amount per paycheck away um, in terms of savings uh, for anything, really, whether it's a car, whether it's their education, um, or whether it's just wanting to to have that little emergency fund in case yeah. something happens. Um, so I think a tax-free savings account for for you know people 18 or older is a great place to start. Um, and then kind of the rest of it stems from there. But I think in terms of tax-free savings accounts, I think there's a huge you know misconception around them, right? That people think, oh, you know, I'm putting money away into a tax-free savings account. I'm good to go. But not realizing that, you know, tax-free savings account is just the account heading. It yep. doesn't mean that you're actually investing within that. Okay. So I think um, there's huge opportunities for people who, you know, have already started in a tax-free savings account, but hadn't, haven't taken advantage of, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds that... What are the rules with a tax-free savings account or TFSA. Mm -hmm. Like, what are the rules? What can you put money in? What can't you put money in? I think it depends on your financial institution. They're the ones who would have the rules. Okay. Um, So you can put anything you want in a tax-free savings account, whether it's a GIC, bond, mutual fund, stock. You can hold anything you want, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Certain companies only offer certain products. So that's where the restrictions might lie. But otherwise, you can hold whatever you want inside of a TFSA. And what's the limit on yearly contributions into it? Yeah, so right now the maximum sixty three thousand five hundred. Sixty three thousand five hundred. Yeah, it seems like a weird number. <laughs> I well, it's just the government of Canada releases uh, in January um, what the limit is for the year, right? And that's the number that that it is this year. So. And how many? How long has it been going on for now? Since two thousand and eight, I believe. So. Can you then, like, if you start putting money into a TFSA, could, like, let's say today, I'm just like, okay, I'm going to put money in a TFSA. Yeah. All I can put in is 6350 or is there that accumulative amount that's been going on year after year? Like, let's say it's like whatever the maximum would be if you made the full contribution every year. Let's say it was like 60000 Could you actually put sixty in? Yeah. Okay. So today, if you were to say, hey, I have $63,500, can I put it in TFSA? Yeah. You can do that one-time lo- uh, contribution, right? Um, and then in January, the government will say, hey, we're allowed another 6000 That's what it was this year. We have no idea what it would be. Yeah. Um, and then you're allowed to top it up that amount, right? Now, can I take the money out whenever I want? You can take the money out whenever you want. Obviously, it's it's tax free, or sorry, you've you're, already paid taxes on the money before your earnings, it's gone though, from whatever investment vehicle is within your TFSA. You don't pay tax on that. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but if you do take it out, so let's say you have sixty three thousand five hundred in your TFSA right now, and you need twenty thousand to buy a new Tesla, um, then it will <laughs> that will um, count against you going forward. So you can't then turn around and say, "Hey, you know, next week I have another twenty. That will work negatively against you in terms of tax time. So you have to wait two calendar years after you withdraw that money Today. in order to recontribute it. That I did not know. There you go. That's interesting. So then, okay, when does an RSP come into play where it makes sense? Because, I mean, really, like, so, like, the difference between an RSP is that it reduces, I guess, your taxable income by making a contribution. And and I guess it's not really a vehicle that you can go in and out of quite frequently. There's a nightmare. Yeah. When should somebody be looking at an RSP versus TFSA then? 
An RRSP comes into play when you want to reduce your tax bracket or mm-hmm. your, your taxable earnings for the year, right? So people should look at RRSPs when they're in you know, a second or third highest tax bracket and they want to bump it down. Um, the idea around an RRSP is don't pay the tax now, pay it in retirement. Mm-hmm. So you have to, I think, putting together a, a financial plan is extremely important to determine, you know, what do you want your after retirement income to be, right? And if it is, you know, in the lowest tax bracket, then it makes sense to take advantage of an RRSP today, right? Mm-hmm. If you're sitting in the second or third, right? Um and that's kind of the difference between the two, right? Is is one reduces your taxable earnings now, but you will pay taxes on that later. Um, but I think you know if you're investing in an RRSP, it's important to take advantage of a TFSA as well um, because they both offer completely different things, yeah. right? So I wouldn't say it's one or the other. I would just say it's how do you utilize both of them to to make your tax situation today and in the future, you know, the most advantageous. Hmm. So I guess if if someone's looking to let's say save for a home, mm-hmm. TFSA or RSP, it depends. It depends on their specific situation, mm-hmm. right? Um, because you know, with the home buyer's plan, you're allowed to take out thirty five thousand dollars from your RSP as a loan, right? It does yep. have to be repaid within fifteen years, um, but you are able to take that out, right? Uh, Tax free, I guess, in a roundabout way. Um, and then you, you can you have to, like I said, pay it back later. But in a TFSA, it depends on what your income is, how much you're contributing to that, right? Because if you're going to save in a TFSA, withdraw that money and want that contribution room mm-hmm. within the next two years to be there, then that might not be the best way to go about doing it, right? It may be the RRSP. So it honestly it depends on your specific situation. Yeah, makes sense, Yeah, right? What else do you want to talk about? <laughs> let's talk markets. Everybody, like, yeah. let's be honest here. Like, okay, like TFSAs, RSPs are interesting. Everybody wants to make more money. Of course. What what makes sense for people? Like, for the and let's talk like the average person. I get everybody's different. Everybody has like I have in like okay. Full disclosure, you're my financial advisor. So let's yeah. get that out of the way. <laughs> you know that I have an insanely high risk tolerance. Correct. Um, I will argue that there's some logic behind it. Um, my wife would probably argue there isn't. Um, <laughs> but I guess, how does somebody go about figuring out their risk tolerance? Let's start there. Because I think that I think it's a very interesting topic, risk tolerance and investing. Yeah, I mean, I think every financial institution has their own version of a risk tolerance questionnaire. Um, and it sounds like uh, every time I put it... Sounds weird. Tolerance, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, but honestly, it's it's the best way to determine what you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. right? Um, and everybody's risk tolerance is different. Uh, so I think, you know... Yeah, when, when you're determining a risk tolerance, you just you go through the questionnaire, determine what people are comfortable with, talk through what that risk tolerance means to them, right? So, okay, your high risk tolerance, this is what it means in terms of what your investments look like mm-hmm. and the market fluctuations you need to be comfortable with based on what you what you answered in the questionnaire, right? Do you find people maybe don't understand risk tolerance? I think that... Or it's, a conf- it's maybe a confusing topic for some people. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. I think that it, it's hard for people to determine their comfort level, right? Because it's not actually happening, right? Yep. It's it's thinking of hypotheticals. What? How would I react if the markets did this? Well, the markets aren't doing that. So yep. right now I'm fine, right? But yep. if you don't like, know... We know markets will go up, which right. is party time, rah, rah. Markets will go down, which right. sucks. Right. But we all know they go up and they go down. Right. Just but it's, it's don't your, freak out. Right. Right. Don't freak out. Exactly. But it's, it's hard, right? When, when you see those numbers on your, on your statement going down because the markets are are taking a hit. So that's the best way for us to determine, to determine how, what you're, what you're comfortable with. Right. Do, um, where do you think people are messing up with investing? I think, Hmm, that's a loaded question. No, it's not. It's just, <laughs> and I mean, like, because you probably have like twenty different answers. But I mean, like, in, yeah. in in reality, like, where do you think is it? Is it people are waiting too long? Because there's the whole money multiplier effect, right? It's like the sooner you start investing, 
I'm assuming, generally speaking, the less money you have to put in because, again, it's well, money multiplies over time. Yeah. So, like, is, is, and maybe I just led you into an easy answer there, but, like, is it that, you know, is it that just people aren't investing earlier enough? I think it could be that, yeah, but I think the problem lies with the education. I don't think people are are not necessarily educated enough, but in a roundabout way, no. yeah, right. Well, they don't they just don't because teach financial literacy. In they school. don't, they right? Just I think they just announced it. Was it this year, or last year? Yeah, that they want to introduce it into high school. Mm-hmm. Which is fantastic. Well, yeah, it makes sense. Right? It should have happened absolutely. eons ago. Exactly, exactly. And I think, um, you know, people just don't know enough about it and therefore they're hesitant to, you know, break into the whole investing world, right? Because people hear negative things like, oh, 2008, people yeah. lost so much money and that makes them hesitant, right? Yeah. But again, I think that, you know, and it's not at fault of anybody, right? No, it's I just, mean, that's the market, that's the ups way and it downs. Is, right, yeah. But I mean, in, in the education part too, I, I don't think it's anybody's fault for not being educated. I just think that's, it's, it's hard to break that barrier sometimes, yeah. right? So where could somebody go to, I guess, make themselves a little bit more aware about the topic? Like what resources exist out there for people who can just like get curious and kind of learn on their own, so to speak? Right. Yeah. There's, there's many different resources, right? Um, I know myself in particular, uh, I hold seminars on a monthly basis um, to try to educate people, right? We host seminars on so many different topics, whether it's estate planning, taxes, TFSAs, retirement readiness, holding workshops, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but ask questions, you know, reach out to the people who you know um, and just ask questions, right? I think... Um, you think a lot of people are afraid to ask questions? I think they are, but they shouldn't be. Yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, I, I do think they are. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, from us, it's just it's just trying to create a, a brand awareness, right? And trying to spread the, spread the knowledge that we have to individuals. Um, but I mean, you can go on any financial market website like Bloomberg or, or anything like I that. I use Bloomberg, yeah. Yeah, of course. And I'm sure you'll find tons of information on there. But it can be overwhelming, right? Yep. Because you sign on to Bloomberg, you see all of these it's headlines and you're like, like oh massive. my gosh, where do I even yeah. start, right? Yep. So I think it's starting back to the basics, right? Of what is a TFSA? What is an RRSP? You know, if I put $25 away today, what does that look like for my retirement, right? Mm -hmm. How much does that fast forward my retirement, right? Um and I think, you know, I think another common misconception around uh, around saving and that kind of stuff is so many people have pensions through work, right? Which is fantastic. And and a lot of the times their employers will match those, their contributions, which again, you're never going to get free money. Yeah, so I just won't take advantage of it. Exactly. Like take it. Yeah. Exactly. So I strongly encourage that always, but... I think some people don't realize that maybe that's not enough for what they want to achieve in retirement. Mm -hmm. So so it's kind of putting together that clarity around, you know, hey, I'm I'm putting away this amount, but is it enough? Yep. Right? And, and I know we think about that. Yeah. And it's, you know, just talking personal experience with it. I mean, you know, if you look at things, I mean, we're probably going to live to see 100. I hope so. Right? Like, no, yeah. but like, really, I mean, that's kind yeah. of where we're trending to is like, okay, like living. And now I look at that and I think that's way too long. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I also just assume that when you get to be a hundred, you know, you've got your knees are shot, your hips are shot. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, I just, that's not me. I like, if I didn't have full mobility and use of my brain and, you know, the ability to walk outside and, and things like, I would just, I would go, I would go nuts. Right. I just, I have a problem. I, like if I, if I do not stay busy, I'm a hazard to the world, <laughs> right? Um, but, but I know, and just, I mean, it's easy to talk about because obviously, you know, you work with Tara and I, but it's, you know, we do talk about, it's like, well, how the heck do you know, like, what is enough for retirement? Yeah. Right? Because I mean, everybody thinks like, oh, we want to travel. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to do that. Now that we're actually sitting here talking about it, though, is like the one element that I don't think Tara and I have ever talked about is like, sure, we want to be able to travel, but generally when you're retired, you also end up having grandchildren and that ties up time. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way, no, but it's course. like, no, it's like, what would you rather do? Go and, you know, travel in Europe for four months or hang out with your grandchildren. 
Right. I'm going to assume that 99% of the time people are like, no, man, like, give me the grandchildren. That's fun, right? Right. But I guess, do, like, how many people really have no idea what they want their retirement to look like? Like, is that is that a common thing you see in people? Like, they're just, I don't know. Like, to me, I'm terrified of right. retirement, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> I think... I think it's it's something that not a lot of people ask, but I think once you do ask, it, it's amazing what people have actually talked about. You yeah. know, um, when I sit down with at least my clients, I, I always ask them, "What do you envision in retirement?" And usually, nine out of ten times, they have an exactly or a clear understanding of what they want. Right? Yeah. Either they want to, you know, live this lavish retirement or sit on their back porch, drink coffee, and they're completely content with that. Right? Um, but they don't get asked it a lot. And I yeah. think that, you know, so when I ask them, I think it at least forces people to think about it and say, okay, you know, what does this lavish retirement look like, right? How much money do I actually need to make that happen, mm-hmm. right? And and I think that's the the area that a lot of people need answered, right? Yeah. But it's it's an interesting... How many people are afraid of retirement? I mean, I'm legitimately, I mean that. Like, I'm terrified of it. Why? I don't know. <laughs> you know why I think? Because I think my father tried to retire and his hair went like white. Okay. Seriously. And like, and like he always had kind of like salt and pepper hair kind of thing, but it was like literally he retired and his hair went white. Right. I just can't imagine like 24 hours in a day is a lot of time. Okay. You, you, like, so you're scared of retirement because you're worried about getting bored. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> it's it's like, honestly. I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't understand golf. I yeah. enjoy golfing at golf tournaments, but I do not understand how somebody could play 90 rounds of golf in a year. Yeah, that yeah. to me seems crazy. Yeah. You know, right? I think from my experience, at least half the people are, are bored out of their minds and, and don't know what to do. But other, other people are kind of like, I have no idea how I even had time to work. Right. Yeah. So I think it just depends on, you just got to figure it out. Yeah. What you, what you like doing. Great. Right? Mm. A lot of people volunteer. Um, yeah. I could yeah. I could see me doing that. Yeah. Um, for a bit. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I could do. I don't know. Maybe but I, I feel just like, like your grandkids and traveling. And yeah. That would that would take up quite yeah. a bit of time, right? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe well, drive my car around. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe you'll yeah. just drive your car around. Yeah. <laughs> so the Feds. Yeah. Lowering interest rates. Yeah. Why would they do that? What are they seeing that maybe the average person doesn't see? Yeah. It, <laughs> To be, to be honest with you, it's, it's interesting because they did it to help stimulate the economy and to help extend the expansion that we're currently in, right? That's why they did it. Yep. Um, but when you actually break it down, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? Because they tried to stimulate something that isn't quite broken yet. Like there's, there's no, yeah, we yeah, have like, an inverted, inverted yield curve, but no. like really we're not going to hit a recession in the next month. Right. But do you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's interesting. Like it's like kicking the, the can, kicking the can down the curb, but it's like, there's no reason to really kick it right now because exactly. it's pretty steady right now. Right yeah, now. Exactly. Why not hold off? And that could change in one month, three months, six you got months, it. save it for that. Exactly. So, I mean, when you look at it from, there's two different sides you can look at it from, right? You can look at it from the employment side. Employment or unemployment in, in the U.S. is lower than it's ever been, mm. right? There's There's been more jobs offered. It's the longest streak that we've yeah. ever had, right? Which Okay, why are they in this state? Like, why are they benefiting like this? What's going on that's really, is it, low interest rates as a policy changes. Do you guys like, do you guys get into that of like, why are they going on the longest tear of like the best employment numbers they've ever seen? Just because of job creation. That's it. They yeah. just created an, an economy that's just firing in all cylinders. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And in our um, wages continue to increase as well. So like from an employment standpoint or unemployment standpoint, I guess the, the U S is actually extremely healthy, right? Consumer spending has gone up, um, as a result of GDP growth, which is great. Um, but when you look at it from a stock perspective, you know, stock prices are are some of the highest we've seen, right? Uh, they're right now 1% away from, the top that they've ever had. So it's an interesting, I'm confused as to the timing as to why the feds would reduce it now. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, they, they did it to stimulate the economy. So I guess we'll wait and see what happens. 
Um, but I guess in the end, and, and I mean, I'll say it cause I don't think you can really say it. I'm looking at it and saying there's an election approaching mm-hmm. and they're basically ramping up to try and call it pad the good stats. Yeah. That's the only thing that I can see yeah. because other, because again, it's, 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 they've got good, good growth. It's good a great growth. economy. Yeah. Got, I mean, globally, they have the best economy right now and they have for a long time. Nobody can compete with it. Right. And if you base it on like historical data about what happened, you know, in 98 and, and 07 and 08, right? Yeah. Um, feds reduce or yeah, reduced cuts or interest rates right in 07. And what happened a couple months later, right? There yeah. was a recession. But again, unemployment was not at the levels that it's at. So, I mean, you can look at historical data and try to determine what's going to yeah. happen, but there's not been one circumstance exactly yeah. like it is now. Yeah. So there, there's no crystal ball. There's no. no, it's, it could go this way. It could go that way. Of course. Know. So of then course. where are we in Canada? Well, like, I feel like we're like the economy's somewhat good here, but I f- like, should we like, what, like, should we be cutting rates? Should I, like, what, what should we be doing? Cause I feel like we're behind. Yeah. I mean, it's just a feeling. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, yeah. Like we're just, yeah, yeah, we're like underperforming, I guess you could yeah. say would be the, <laughs> the more technical way of yeah, explaining yeah. it. Yeah. But well, in Canada, it's an interesting story. The Bank of Canada has already said that they're either going to keep interest rates the same or reduce them based on what the economy yeah. needs. I feel like the BOC is just more cautious. In I general. think so. They, they move slower. Yep. Yeah. Which not necessarily a bad thing. Agreed. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing in Canada, though, is that debt levels are, are way higher than they've ever been. Yeah. Which is somewhat concerning. Yeah. Like um, ridiculous. Yeah. How high they are. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting, at least from, you know, sitting in my chair. It's it's an interesting perspective. Right. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I don't have the crystal ball, but. Again, we can just take what we know from historical data and, and times and and go with that. So what can somebody expect from like from an expense standpoint from having a financial advisor? Like does it cost them money? How do you guys get paid? Yeah, how do we get paid? That's yeah. a very valid question. Um, I think a lot of the times people think that they're getting free advice. And, you know, you and I both know we both have to get paid yes. in order to go to work we every day, right? Of course, yes. Yeah. I have to eat. Exactly. And drink coffee. So largely, um, at least at Edward Jones and, and multiple companies, um, it's through MERs, which is a mutual funds. So every mutual fund that you purchase, whether it's disclosed or not, you are paying fees on. Yep. Um, and that's, that's largely how we get paid. So MERs are management expense ratios. And like I said, they're charged on every mutual fund. Mm-hmm. Um, for fixed income mutual funds, they're usually a percent or two less than what they would be for more equity focused, right? Because basically the reason why an MER is being charged is because somebody's sitting behind the fund, picking and choosing what goes into it, being yep. actively managed, right? And just like you and me, that person has bills as well and yep. needs to get paid. So every mutual fund, like I said, has a percentage that's charged on it. Um, they've recently reduced them at, for the industry as a whole, which is fantastic. Yep. Um, why was is it just technology makes things faster, more cost effective, or of course, yeah, just definitely needed to be more competitive. I think it's a bit of both, to yeah. be honest with you. Um, definitely more competitive because uh, I think companies are starting to realize, mutual fund companies are starting to realize that they do need to be a little bit more competitive in that space in order to earn the business as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like you said, you know, people are getting their their analytics and their data. The companies are getting their analytics and their data, um, which makes it more cost effective. So they're able to reduce those fees, mm-hmm. um, which makes it obviously more affordable for the investor. But I think the common misconception you know, especially with with individuals who are dealing with a bank or something like that, they think, oh, you know, I'm I'm investing, I'm not paying anything, but it's just not being disclosed, and and that's uh, unfortunate, I guess, yeah. about our industry. To be honest with yeah. you, um, every industry's got yeah, less, like you know, positives and negatives. Of it's course, normal. yeah, but of that mer, you know, obviously a portion goes to a portion goes to the the fund manager, and a yeah. portion comes to myself. So when should somebody, I guess, like, why would somebody want to invest in a mutual fund versus like a specific stock? It depends, right? Um, if somebody, it, 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 X is part of, well, no, you can keep it, I guess, but. What do you want to do? 
You can keep it. So for stocks, you're owning that individual company, right? So you have to look at you know your portfolio value mm-hmm. um, because if you're going to properly diversify, you need to purchase several stocks, right? You can't yep. put all of your eggs in one basket and just buy one stock. I'm not betting a hundred percent on Tesla. No, not, not ideally. <laughs> no, you shouldn't um, that. but in a mutual fund, it's a pooled, right? So you yep. have about 40 different stocks, bonds, um, that are all comprised in there. So you get that diversification for far less, right? Um, because when you're purchasing a stock, you want to make sure that you have a decent amount of money to do so. Right. Mm-hmm. And like I said, properly diversify. So, I think that mutual funds and stocks can work very well together in a portfolio, right, to diversify even further. But there is a point to over diversification too. So you really need to discuss, you know, what's best for your specific situation, right? Yep. Um, but if you had, you know, a company that you're extremely passionate about that you wanted to purchase, like me, like you, yes, um, you might not get that in a mutual fund. So therefore, you'd look for a stock, right, and and then you can own it directly, right? Mm-hmm. Stock Stocks are obviously more volatile than mutual funds. So it kind of is is a trade-off. It just depends what's right for you. So what kind of debt is good debt versus, I guess, what kind of debt's bad debt? Yeah, I mean... I said it before, I, I don't think there's any type of good debt, right? I mean, Fair everybody's, enough. I'm sure, end goal is to be debt-free, right? Uh, which is great. I that's, would hope that's... Bro, that's yeah. ideally, right? Um, that being said, though, you know, mortgages, that's could be considered good debt, right? You, you do need to build credit somehow, right? Yep. Um, I would say it would come down to cash flows, though. What can your income on a monthly basis withstand, right? How much debt, right? Mm-hmm. Um you know, some people have, have credit cards, right? But they pay them off on a monthly basis. That could be considered good debt. You're building good credit and it's constantly getting paid off. However, as soon as it becomes uncontrollable, that's when you've accumulated way too much debt and you need to reel it back in. So I think, you know, credit cards, line of credits, loans, that kind of stuff, you want to try to stay away from. But if you can manage it, it's okay to have some of it. What's the average interest rate on a credit card? Oh God, that depends. Um, Like like the 20 to 28% kind of range or something like that, isn't it? I think. 15 to 22. Okay, 15 to 22. Yeah. Okay, so I was off. Yeah. If if somebody had $10,000, let's say, Mm -hmm. on a whatever credit card. Yep. And they were making a minimum monthly payment. How long roughly does it take for them to pay that money off? And really, if like I'm just using ten thousand, like roughly, what would that ten thousand dollars truly cost them? Do you have any idea off the top of your head? Well, it depends how long they held it for, right? Because then you'd have to just times the I guess, principal yeah, by the interest rate, yeah. right? But um, so, like, I guess then is it literally you would probably take? Isn't it something like eighty years to pay it off? It, it would be substantial. Yeah. Yes. And and really, the ten thousand dollars would probably cost you like a hundred thousand. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. But if you're consec- like if you're constantly paying that debt off, right? Yeah, if, if you put ten thousand and yeah, you pay boom, that off, down, boom, down. Yeah, then, it's more like if you're always carrying ten. Yeah. And I'm just using. I don't know why I'm using ten. Yeah, that's it's fine. just an easy round yeah. number. Yeah. It's literally. It is like it. It's insanely crippling. Is what I'm getting at, right? Like you really need to get rid of that. Uh, definitely, you yeah. definitely need to get rid of that for sure. Especially when you're paying twenty two percent interest potentially on a credit card, right? that can have negative long-term effects, right? Yep. Because if you're struggling with cash flows currently and you know a lot of your money is going towards that interest, it's just going to have a rippling effect, right? Yep. So you definitely, debt management is is huge. Um, obviously something we, we help people with, but um, it's definitely something that people need to, to talk about. So, okay. So like, let's say if somebody out there is struggling with debt management, mm-hmm. would it, that be a conversation they should be having with a financial advisor? Does of that make, I mean, of course. Yeah. I mean, specific to Edward Jones, we don't deal with debt consolidation yeah. loans or anything yeah, that's like very that. Unique kind of, of course, but it's definitely something that we help with. Right. I mm-hmm. mean, how does your credit cards and your lines of credit and all that kind of stuff play into your retirement? What, what effect is that going to have that kind of stuff? We definitely have conversations around that. I just, I deal with that 
regularly, right? Because a lot of people do carry debt, right? And it's not yep. always bad, right? I mean, if you can manage it, then it could be considered good. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get zero interest, I would highly recommend doing that option if you know you're buying a car or something like that and you can do 0% down, zero interest or whatever. Yeah. Why not? Why not, right? But again, especially you if you're putting your, like you say, if you're putting your money someplace else and you're getting 8%, well, right. if that car's costing you zero and then you can make your eight, well, why not make your, why eight? not do the spread? Yeah. yeah. But again, then it comes down to cash flow, right? If you are making monthly payments, can your monthly, you know, income support that extra, extra amount, right? So mm-hmm. it's give and take, it's dependent on specific situations, but yeah, there is good and bad debt for sure. <laughs> so what would be kind of like an average dollar amount for somebody to budget to have per year in retirement? That completely depends on the kind of lifestyle the individual wants to live in retirement. Um, some people, like I said, want to live extremely lavish lifestyles. Like and 90 years old, rocking a Lambo. Why and not? if they have enough money, go ahead and do sure. that, right? Um, but if... You know, some people are comfortable just within the confines of their own home. They don't want to travel. And and it's completely subjective to whatever that individual wants to do. However, if that's a question you have, then I would urge you to go out and talk to a financial advisor, put together a retirement plan, talk through those details of what you want, and we'll be able to tell you to the dollar what you need. What you need based off of what based lifestyle on, you Based on, yeah. Want. Because so many things come into play, right? Are there, okay, well, like, are there, is there any study out there where they've said, you know, the, you know, an average is maybe not good to say, but whatever, like for the average person in retirement, you should budget to have between X and Y. Like, are there even studies like that to help guide people? <laughs> not really, no, to be honest. No, because it's really you, just specific of it, what yeah. lifestyle do you want. Well, exactly. And another thing, when do you want to retire, right? Yeah. Some people want to retire at 70. Some people want to retire at 50. If you're retiring at 50, you have, if your life expectancy is 90, you have, you know, 40, 40 years, years. That's a long time. Right? So you're going to need you're far gonna more money. You're going to live in retirement more than you did working or you like it. living as a Adult. contributing yeah. person of society you with a job. It. You got it. Right. But if you want to live to 70, then you may only have 20 years of retirement. So that's going to significantly. So there's just, there's too yeah. many variables for me to be able to say, Hey, it's, you know, X amount of dollars because it, there's just too many things that play into it. However, you know, there is plans that put that, that information together. Yeah. Right. And I think that's one, one big, um, question, I guess, right, is is again back to the pension thing, right? You're contributing, you're putting money away. Is it enough, right? And uh, that's at least what I, I strive to do is provide that clarity, clarity to people, right? So Renee, what expenses do retired people have? Yeah. So when I'm putting together a, a retirement plan for people, one of the biggest questions or the challenges that we have is determining what you need as a monthly income or annual income in retirement. And, you know, everybody's always gives me that blank face like, well, I don't know what I'm going to spend 20, 40 years from now. So what I try to do is dial it back to what you're currently spending. Okay. Mm-hmm. What are the variable expenses and what are your fixed expenses? So For example, uh, right now, you know, you have your property taxes, you have your hydro, you have your car insurance, your house insurance, all that stuff is going to be there in retirement, right? Because those are fixed expenses. You're always going to have those stuff like, you know, your vehicle payments, your credit cards, your mortgages, that kind of stuff. Um, any dependents or children that you're currently supporting, hopefully, you know, in 20 years, you probably won't be supporting them as well. Right. So all of those are variable expenses. Why I'm just, I don't know. I'm just thinking about my kids. They better not be in the house. And, <laughs> like, you never know. They, they might be, but that's a good place to start. Right. Yep. And then, so, okay, you take what your fixed expenses are today. What will still likely be there in retirement, add inflation to it, and then that's what you'll likely need on a monthly basis in retirement. So it's a good place to start based on your current, even though you have no idea what you're going to be spending yeah. 20 years down the road. But it's it's a good place to start at Baseline least. Baseline it yeah. off that. Off of what you're currently doing that will still be there, right? Some people do carry a mortgage into retirement, which is fine as well. So that's another thing. It might be there for the first five years and then it might drop off. You never know, yeah. right? But it's definitely, it's it's challenging, right? Because people always think about it as Well, this. and, it, and it, you're not talking, you know, for the most part, it's not two years down the road. No. It's 20, 30 years down the road, which it's like... Pfft, 
I don't know what I'm doing two weeks from now. Right, right. But it's in order to determine. Could be shoveling snow. It could be. You never know. I don't know. Hopefully not. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but it's it's part of the plan, right? You need to know what you're going to spend in retirement in order to accurately save for it, right? Mm-hmm. Because some people, you know, are comfortable with twenty thousand dollars a year, and other people want ninety. So yeah. you need to determine roughly with that, right? But as you get closer and closer to retirement, that number becomes so much more important, yeah. right? Now you're just kind of guessing. Um, but each year, you know, people will come to me and say, "Hey, I think that we need to increase that," or you know, maybe we might be a little high. Let's decrease it a little bit, and then see how what those numbers do do to your retirement. It's Matt Santa Capital from the Santa Sells Houses team. Thank you very much for coming in, Renee. Uh, hopefully, you know, people got some value from this. I always enjoy our conversations. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank I appreciate you. it.